I'm Debbie Walsh, and I'm director of the Center for American Women and Politics at the Eagleton Institute of Politics here at Rutgers. And it is my pleasure, along with Eagleton's director, Ruth Mandel, to welcome all of you on what has turned out to be an unexpectedly and quite remarkable day. And we are delighted that so many of you are joining us for this very special occasion. As you can see from your program, this afternoon's event was made possible by the generous support of the New Jersey legislature for the Senator Winona Littman Chair in women's political leadership. The chair was created to inspire and encourage women to follow in Senator Littman's footsteps. And we are honored to be joined today by a terrific delegation of New Jersey legislators. And I've been told that we will shortly be graced with the presence of a, a, path, a path breaker and a pioneer in her own right, Sheila Oliver, who is the first African-American woman to serve as Speaker of the New Jersey Assembly. I also want to recognize um, the other New Jersey legislators who have generously given their time and joined us today, Senators Nia Gill and Shirley Turner. You could. And Assemblywomen Joan Quigley and Linda Stender and Assemblyman Upendra Chivakula. We hope that the speakers and the, the speaker and the legislators who are here with us today will convey our thanks to their colleagues in Trenton for making this program possible. A distinguished advisory committee also aids us in implementing the Littman Chair, and I'd like to thank the members of that group who are here today. I've already introduced Shirley Turner and Nia Gill, and I, I want to add that Nia Gill, among her many distinctions, actually babysat for Senator Littman's children many, many years ago and then went on uh, to be her aide and eventually to serve in the State Senate. So talk about following in someone's footsteps. I also want to introduce Sandra DeGenest, who is Senator Littman's niece and a leader in the Newark Public Schools and someone who's been extraordinarily helpful to us over time on this project. <laughs> Kathy Crotty, who is the former executive director of the New Jersey Senate Democrats and a longtime colleague of Senator Littman, and in many ways this started out as her brainchild. So thank you, Kathy. And finally, Alma Saravia, who worked with Winona Littman for many years as executive director of the Commission on Sex Discrimination and the Statutes, who has really done an enormous amount to make sure that the legacy of Senator Littman goes on. So thank you, Alma. I'm also delighted that we're joined here today by Newark Councilwoman Mildred Crump. So Mildred. From the Senator's City. Uh, you can learn a bit about Winona Littman in your program, and you can find an expanded bio of this extraordinary woman on COP's website. But perhaps most important for you to know is Senator Littman was the legislature's leading advocate on behalf of women, children, families, low-income people, and people with AIDS. She helped to establish and then chaired the state's commission on sex discrimination in the statutes uncovering and analyzing discriminations, discrimination in New Jersey's laws, and then initiating legislation to eliminate inequality. She tackled issues including employment discrimination, child support, children's rights, sexual assault, and domestic violence. For many years, she was the only woman in the state Senate, and there are a number of folks here who served with her in those years. She always was the voice for those with the least access to the political process and always alert to the political implications of race and gender. So you can understand why the center is so proud to have been tapped to celebrate Senator Littman's legacy. One of the most important ways we do that is by presenting prominent speakers whose work addresses issues and ideas that were central to the senator's career and to her work. And while Senator Menendez has generously taken on the role of introducer, I want to use my time introducing the introducer to say on behalf of the center 
and Rutgers how delighted and honored we are to welcome Valerie Jarrett to deliver this year's lecture, particularly at such an historic moment in both our nation's history and President Obama's administration. I know I woke up this morning wondering, would this really happen? Um, and we are delighted that it is. Knowing that this accomplished and impressive woman has achieved such a prominent position in the White House, led by our first African-American president, would no doubt have pleased Senator Littman immensely. And now it is my very great honor to present a valued friend of Cop and Eagleton, someone who helps us whenever we ask, and he might say we ask him an awful lot. He, all, he helped us, in fact, in extending the invitation to this afternoon's speaker, and I'm really delighted to be able to introduce him today. Senator Robert Menendez served in the U.S. House of Representatives from 1993 to 2006, rising to become the third highest ranking Democrat. Appointed to the U.S. Senate in 2006, he went on to win a full term later that year. In November of 2008, he was chosen to head the Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee. Before his election to Congress, he served as a school board member, a mayor, a state legislator, and his time in the state Senate actually overlapped with that of Senator Littman. So it is entirely fitting that he should be today's introducer, and I am very pleased to present Senator Robert Menendez. Thank you, Debbie, very much for that gracious introduction. Uh, you delivered it just as I wrote it for you, so I appreciate it. <laughs> no, that's not true. It's very gracious of you. I appreciate it. Before I introduce uh, Valerie Jarrett, just let me take a moment to recognize the extraordinary events in our country. For the families of 3,000 Americans, including 700 New Jerseyans, I hope that uh, yesterday's historic moment in the assassination of Osama bin Laden brings a measure of closure to those families. It will never bring their loved ones back, but I hope it brings a sense of justice as well. And I, uh, and I want to recognize the men and women who serve our country in uniform throughout the world, who risk their lives every day so that we can convene in places like this, and especially the Navy SEALs who risked their life yesterday to successfully perform that operation. And finally, I, I want to acknowledge a president who did not make speeches but whose quiet determination and commitment to the use of uh, American intelligence to ensure that ultimately Osama bin Laden would be found, uh, and then a steely determination to make sure that it was executed uh, took place. And I want to salute President Obama as well in that effort. I'm pleased, uh, I'm pleased to be at Rutgers to celebrate the good work of the Center for American Women in Politics that uh, takes place here all the time. And honored to have the opportunity to introduce a woman who is the embodiment of the Center's mission to promote a deeper, clearer understanding of the role that women are playing in the political process. I think we can all agree that there are few women in politics who have a clearer understanding of the process or a better seat at the table than Valerie Jarrett. Before I introduce her, I want to say a word about another influential woman, the New Jersey woman from whom the lecture is named. Winona Lippman made history as the first African-American woman to be elected to the state Senate, but her legacy was far more than winning one historic electoral victory. It was what she did during a long 27-year career serving the people of the 29th Legislative District at the time that not only made history in New Jersey, but changed it. When Winona Lippmann was elected in 1971, we were emerging from a turbulent decade. Three of our heroes, John Kennedy, Martin Luther King, and Robert Kennedy had been gunned down. Millions of Americans marched in support of women's equality and for equal rights and justice for all Americans. In that decade, we passed the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act, and then in 1971, New Jerseyans elected Winona Lippmann to the state Senate. We entered a new era, and things in this nation had begun to change. We've come a long way since then, but there's still a long way to go. 
Winona Lippman was a trailblazer for all those who would follow, and she made New Jersey a better place to live and raise a family. I had the privilege of serving with her in the State Senate, as Debbie uh, said, and I will never forget her infectious smile, her soft-spoken voice, but a steely determination to be a champion for women, children, and justice in general. Today, in remembering her, we honor all women who have followed in her footsteps, and one of those women is our distinguished lecturer today, Valerie Jarrett. Valerie comes from a history-making family herself. Her great-grandfather was the first African-American to graduate from MIT. Her grandfather was the first African-American to head the Chicago Housing Authority. And her father, Dr. James Bowman, was the first African-American to do his residency at Chicago St. Luke's Hospital. So she is no, no stranger to making history in her own right. She is one of President Barack Obama's most trusted and influential advisors. From her early days navigating the turbulent waters of Chicago politics, she has been known as a problem solver, a negotiator, a decision maker. She left a successful legal career to enter public service, working for nearly a decade for the city of Chicago, first for Chicago's first African-American mayor, Harold Washington, and then becoming deputy chief of staff to Mayor Richard Daley, then planning commissioner, then chairwoman of the Chicago Transit Authority. And having been a mayor, I know what it takes to run a city. It takes a strong, intelligent, respected problem solver like Valerie Jarrett on your side, a committed public servant who understands that the life of a city is about the lives of people and the different needs of every neighborhood, every group of people, almost street by street. When Valerie Jarrett left Chicago for Washington and the White House, she brought with her something she learned in city government. And that was the realization that governing is not always theoretical, not always driven by ideology or policy debates. Governing is about fairness and a deep and abiding understanding of how to solve problems in the everyday lives of real people and how to keep a city, or in this case, a nation moving forward. Now, in many ways, she is the president's problem solver. A New York Times profile said, quote, Valerie Jarrett is a Washington outsider with a mind-deadening job title, senior advisor to the president for intergovernmental affairs and public engagement. Roughly translated, she is Obama's intermediary to the outside world. The article goes on to say that she is, quote, the president's closest friend in the White House, but that her influence leaves few fingerprints. President Obama once said of Valerie Jarrett, I trust her completely. Our relationship evolved to a point where she's like a sibling to me. She's family. She combines the closeness of a family member with the savvy and objectivity of a professional businesswoman and public policy expert. He described her as the ultimate utility player, someone who could step into any role, and she has stepped into many roles and done them all well. The president has said that she has always pushed him to trust his instincts, recalling the 2008 campaign and Valerie telling him that he should handle the race issue head on, which led to one of his most famous and influential speeches that will live in the annals of American race history. Valerie Jarrett can take a fair amount of credit for that decision. She and the president first met when Michelle Obama applied for a job in the mayor's office in Chicago, and Valerie convinced Barack Obama that it was the right job for his then fiance. And it was from that moment that her influence and friendship with both the future president and first lady grew. She has called herself the president's sounding board. I would call her the president's reality check. The person who reminds him of home, of Chicago, of community, of why he ran for president, and what public service and governing are all about the person whose influence and counsel helped elect him President of the United States, for which we are grateful. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me a high honor and distinct privilege to introduce the friend, confidant, sounding board, ultimate utility player, and the senior advisor to the President of the United States, Valerie Jarrett. Thank you. Oh, my goodness. Thank you, thank you. Please have a seat. Thank you so much, Senator, for that extraordinary introduction. Thank you for that applause. Good afternoon, everyone. 
I'll tell you, after an introduction like that, the smartest thing one should do is say thank you and sit down. <laughs> it, was, it was really terrific, and I am so moved to be here. I want to thank also Debbie Walsh, who I had a chance to spend some time with, and she uh, was a enabled me to meet so many of the young people who are here today. I want to thank the Center for American Women and Politics and the Eagleton Institute for hosting this event. I am just deeply, deeply honored to be here. A little earlier today, I had a chance to meet many of Winona Lippmann's friends and family. And I appreciate their presence here as we celebrate the legacy of her leadership. During her career, Senator Lippmann advocated on behalf of women and minorities and AIDS patients and victims of domestic violence. She understood how to connect economics and equality. She linked the policy initiatives to the moral imperative. And she passionately believed that government should reflect our deepest personal values. Her legacy is carried forward by elected officials such as State Senator Loretta Weinberg, who I had a chance to meet earlier. What a dynamo. And <laughs> she is something. It's carried forward by Speaker Sheila Oliver, the first African-American woman to become the Speaker of the New Jersey State Assembly. And it is carried forward by Senator Barbara Bonona, the highest ranking woman in New Jersey State Senate history. Please, a round of applause for all of them. Now, I am particularly touched to be here in New Jersey on this very, very special day for our country. As President Obama said earlier, I think we can all agree that this is a good day for America. That's right. It's a good day for the United States, and indeed, it's a good day for the world, because the world is a safer and better place because of the capture and death of Osama bin Laden. From the outset of his administration, President Obama and his national security team have done everything in their power to protect the American people from the threat of terrorism. In the earliest days of his presidency, he formally instructed his CIA director, the intelligence community, his counterterrorism advisors, to make the pursuit of Osama bin Laden a top priority in our war against Al Qaeda. Last August, President Obama was told that our intelligence community had the possible lead on Osama bin Laden's whereabouts. And in the lead up to this operation, the President convened at least nine meetings with his national security principals. On Friday morning, President Obama gave the final order to pursue an operation against bin Laden's compound. And as the world now knows, during that operation, Osama bin Laden was killed. We all remember the pain that we felt on 9-11. We remember the nearly 3,000 innocent people who were murdered that day. They were our husbands, our wives, our sisters, our brothers, our children, our parents, our colleagues, our friends. And so it is really deeply moving for me to be speaking so close to New York City today. I know that many members of your community were directly affected by the September 11th attack. And while nothing can fill the void that was left by the death of the loved ones, as the President said last night, justice has been done. The operation against bin Laden was also a reminder of the bravery and the courage of our men and women in uniform and of our intelligence and counterterrorism and homeland security personnel who for 10 years, as the senator said, have quietly but with determination been seeking to find Osama bin Laden and fight Al Qaeda overseas and protect our freedom right here at home. They've made tremendous sacrifices on our behalf, sometimes even the ultimate sacrifice, so that we can be safe and free, and we owe them our gratitude. As the President made clear in his remarks, the cause of securing our country is not yet complete. But we are once again reminded that Americans can do whatever we set our minds to. 
Now, as the senator mentioned, I first met Barack Obama. You were kind enough not to mention exactly how many years ago it was. But it was 20 years ago this summer, 1991, before he was married, before he entered politics, before he had written any best-selling books or spoken at the convention and captivated the nation and the world with his spirit. And even back then, I was struck by his extraordinary leadership qualities, which are the very same qualities that the world saw last night. Toughness, integrity, patience, resilience, vision, patriotism, and love of country. These are just some of the qualities that true leaders have. President Obama understands that hard things are hard. But that doesn't stop him, and nor should it stop us. When he sets a goal, he does whatever is necessary to achieve that goal. We've seen this time and time again since the president took office. No president would have chosen to inherit two wars. No president would have chosen to inherit a partisan political culture. Certainly no president would have chosen to inherit the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression, together with a health care crisis and an energy crisis and a public education crisis and a crisis in terms of our reputation abroad. But that's exactly what President Obama inherited. And he's made the kind of tough decisions that protect our country and safeguard our ideals and our future. That kind of, co of courage is a requirement of true leadership. The courage to stand up for what you believe in, the courage to move forward when gale winds push you, am I right, Senator, backwards, and the courage to challenge yourself and listen most closely to those with whom you disagree. For having to defend an argument only makes it better. After listening to all perspectives, leaders are prepared to make tough decisions and absorb everyone's pain. Over the course of the last two years, I've had the honor of watching Obama, President Obama do this time and time again. The toughest and most painful decisions, of course, are the ones that involve placing our men and women in harm's way. In December of 2009, I attended uh, the president's speech in front of an audience of cadets at West Point, where the president announced that he was sending 30,000 more soldiers to Afghanistan. He didn't shy away from the awful cost of war. He spoke about signing letters of condolence to military families, visiting our wounded warriors at Walter Reed, traveling to Dover, to see caskets of American soldiers arrive at home for the very last time. But he also made it clear that as a leader, his job was to act, and that's exactly what we saw last night. President Obama also absorbs the pain of supporters who are understandably impatient with how long actual ta change takes. Many of his supporters thought he would wave a magic wand and the world would change instantly. But we know that doesn't happen. So from sweeping legislation, passing the Affordable Care Act, to repealing don't ask, don't tell, change took time. But due to the president's steadfast conviction and tenacity, those acts, as many as well as many, many others, got done. I remember the evening of the Affordable Care Act's passage. And the president invited his entire team that worked on the bill to a spontaneous party up in the West Wing, up actually in the residence in his home. His wife was out of town, and so he thought he could throw a little party. <laughs> Sounds familiar? Well, the little party grew because he invited everyone from the junior most staff person to the vice president of the United States, everyone who'd worked on the bill. And in the wee hours of the night, after the, audio, after the crowd began to die down a little bit, I asked the president how he was feeling that night compared to election night. And he said that election night merely created the possibility for change. But the passage of the Affordable Care Act turned our hopes into a reality and that that was cause to celebrate. The president is no less committed to passing comprehensive immigration reform. He recognizes with a new Congress, hurdles are higher, but that doesn't mean we give up. Leaders do hard things. But at the same time, they distinguish themselves with civility and compassion. Their genuine goodness and core decency. At times, we've seen our nation's discourse take a harsh tone and an angry tone. We each have a responsibility to change that tone. 
President Obama spoke of this in the aftermath of the January tragedy in Tucson. Some tried to use the shooting as an excuse to vilify people and groups with whom they disagree. He said, and I quote, rather than pointing fingers or assigning blame, let us use this occasion to expand our moral imagination, to listen to each other more carefully, to sharpen our instinct for empathy and remind ourselves of all of the ways our dreams and hopes are bound together. As you'll remember, a nine-year-old girl, Christina Taylor Green, was one of the victims in Tucson. She was there because she wanted to meet her congresswoman. The president challenged us and himself to make sure that her tragic death was not in vain. He said, I want us to live up to her expectations. I want our democracy to be as good as she imagined it to be. All of us, we should do everything we can to make sure that this country lives up to our children's expectations. In that moment in Tucson, President Obama inspired all of us to be better. We've made a great deal of progress over the last two years since the president has been in office and there is still obviously hard work ahead, but we have reason to be optimistic. Looking forward, as we begin to see signs of the economic recovery, President Obama has turned our nation's efforts towards winning the future by out-educating, out-innovating, and out-building our competitors around the world. We are a nation founded on innovation and entrepreneurship, and we must nurture our creativity and prepare our next generation, many of you in this room, to compete in the global marketplace. And we must create a smarter, more efficient government. As the President Obama said recently in the State of the Union, we cannot win the future with a government of the past. This is no time to scale back our ambition. That's not what true leaders do. The President put it simply. He said, we do big things in America, as individuals and as a nation. And here today at the Center for American Women in Politics, it's fitting to describe how we are expanding opportunities for women and girls. One of President Obama's first acts was to sign an executive order creating the White House Council on Women and Girls, and I am deeply honored to have been selected as its chair. Its mandate is simply to include every agency in the federal government and make sure that every program, every policy, every piece of proposed legislation takes into account the needs of women and girls. In March, the Obama administration released a report titled Women in America. The report compiled data from across all of the federal agencies in order to highlight both the opportunities and, yes, the challenges still facing women and girls in America. Our report was one of the many that show that the composition of the American family is changing. Two-thirds of all children are, in our, are either in households that are headed by a single parent or two working parents. This means that issues affecting women's education, health, income, and careers are not just women's issues. They affect the entire family. They affect every community, and they affect our nation. With that in mind, it's encouraging to see the progress that women are achieving, particularly in education. Today, younger women are more likely than men to graduate from college. They're more, li more likely to hold a graduate degree. And a majority of Americans' high school graduates are women. Women are more likely than men to participate in adult education. But our report also shows disparities that we cannot afford to ignore. S despite the many gains in education and graduation rates, women continue to underperform in science, technology, engineering, and math, so-called STEM subjects. Women are dramatically underrepresented in leadership positions, and not just in politics, but in the private sector as well. And sadly, women still only earn 77% of what men earn. In other words, we still have a lot of work to do. This issue is very personal for President Obama. His mother was a researcher, teacher, and an expert in international development. She devoted a great deal of her life to making microloans available to women who were starting small businesses. He remembers her teaching him that when you can, t you can tell a lot about how far a society is going 
but how it treats our, its women and its girls. And if they're, they're doing well, then the society is going to do well. And if they're not, then the society won't be. The president's mother was also a single parent, and she watched, he watched her struggle to make ends meet as she balanced the demands of a career with the needs of her two children. The president's grandmother, who helped raise him, worked in a bank in Hawaii, and for two decades, men who she trained were promoted above her. And as the president told an audience of women business leaders last year, I know that if given a chance, she would have run the bank better than anyone, but she never got that opportunity. These experiences have helped shape President Obama's character and his values. He supported the First Lady, a very smart man, throughout her career, and he is determined to make sure that his daughters grow up able to compete with men on an evil, even playing field in any subject and in any career that their hearts pursue. So it's no surprise that the very first bill he signed was the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act, which <laughs> the act strengthens a woman's right to sue her employer for equal pay, and he still plans, Senator, to, pass, to push for passage of the Paycheck Fairness Act, which will ensure that, as the President said, men and women who do equal work receive the equal pay that they and their families deserve. So that's on our agenda. <laughs> the President has also made workplace flexibility a key element of his labor agenda. He's put forward an education plan designed to increase the number of women who study in the STEM fields. And as our economy recovers, his administration is supporting women entrepreneurs with programs such as the new Women-Owned Small Business Rule, which helps women-owned businesses compete in more than 80 industries where they're underrepresented in federal contracting because we need to lead by example. And the Obama administration is also taking unprecedented steps in using existing federal law to support women and girls. For example, Vice President Biden and Arne Duncan recently issued historic new guidelines with regard to Title IX. They made it clear that schools that receive federal money have a responsibility to protect students from sexual violence. <laughs> and at a time when one in five young women is a victim of sexual violence, this is a new and vitally important application of this law. If women are going to become leaders in their communities, they first need to feel safe in their communities. President Obama has also supported women's leadership by appointing two women to the Supreme Court, including the first Latina. And I give you my personal assurance that the women in the White House and in the Cabinet have surrounded him with a close circle and advise him closely. Each of these extraordinary women is, ex is extraordinary in her own right, and collectively they add to the strength and the value of his team. Having more women in leadership positions is not just the result of a better process. It creates, as we all know, better outcomes. This is not an article of faith or ideology. Study after study shows that when leaders are drawn from a wide and diverse perspective, organizations are more successful. In 2007, McKinsey and Company studied gender diversity in businesses around the world. And they concluded, what won't surprise you, companies with a higher proportion of women on their management committees are also the companies that have the best performance. What is true for business is also true for government. For decades, the country's leading political scientists, including many of those at the Center for American Women in Politics, have found that when more women hold public office, issues regarding women, children, education, and health care receive more attention. Women are more likely to include a wide range of individuals in policy-making process, and because women tend to approach problems a little differently than men, to all the good men in the audience, they offer new kinds of solutions. Today, it seems appropriate to highlight one of those solutions. 
our First Lady, Michelle Obama, and the Vice President's wife, Jill Biden, have begun, a have begun a national campaign called Joining Forces with a very simple message that everyone can do something to support our military families and veterans. At a moment when we honor the brave men and women in our military, we should also recognize the extraordinary patriotism and strength of their loved ones. And today, if you find yourself looking for a way to give back to our military families, I encourage you to join, to go to our website, joiningforces.gov, where you can learn more about what each and every one of you can do to honor their service and their families. Of course, giving our military families the support they need won't be easy. Neither will continuing our struggle against terrorism or reforming our immigration system or expanding opportunities for our nation's women and girls. All these challenges will be very hard to overcome. But when we face adversity, and we will, I hope we remember how we felt last night when we were learning that a man behind the 9-11 attack had finally been brought to justice. I hope we remember the jubilation and the relief all across our country and the world. I hope we remember the images of the New York firefighters celebrating in Times Square and the 5,000 people, many of them young people, who celebrated in front of the White House. I know that President Obama will never forget those images. The images of those who were singing and waving flags and shouting, shouting with joy. Above all else, they were proud to be American. Many of those young people were still children when Osama bin Laden attacked us on 9-11. Their lives have been shaped by terror, by war, and more recently by a deep, deep recession. But as they celebrated last night, they sent a very powerful message. We still believe, we, speak, we still believe that in America, anything is possible. As the president said last night, last night was a testament to the greatness of our country and the determination of the American people. It gave us a chance to restore the feeling of unity that we experienced after 9-11. In the coming days and the weeks and years ahead, I hope we all do our best to keep that feeling of unity alive by staying engaged in the hard but necessary work ahead. I hope we try to cultivate and emulate the qualities of true leadership. I hope all of us, young and old, appreciate the power we each have to come together and win the future. Let's seize the moment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very flattered. And now for the Q&A, which is my favorite part. Well, Ms. Jarrett has graciously agreed to do some questions from us, and we have her for a very limited time. So to kind of streamline the process, we took questions from folks online beforehand and here in the room, so we have a few of them. Um, we're going to start off with, the first one is, we all remember where we were on September 11th, 2001, and I'm quite sure that we're all going to remember where we were on the evening of May 1st, 2011. What is it like to be part of the Obama administration at this historic moment? Uh, well, I'll tell you, I'm going to tell you guys a story. Um, and I, I often include this in, in my speeches, but this question prompts the story. Deeply honored and humbled is the answer to your question, but it reminds me of a man. I often tell stories about leadership and the qualities that the president has, but I often end by telling a story of a man whose name I do not know. And I met him during the campaign when the president was running for president during the primary season. And we were in Austin, Texas. And we were leaving our hotel early one morning, and the Texas part of the primary was particularly grueling and long and exhausting. And early, early one morning, we were leaving our hotel, and there was an African-American elevator operator who had taken us up to our room during the three days that we were there. And uh, the president had a cold, and he's actually not a morning person. 
between us. Uh, so he was a little grumpy. And uh, as we got into the elevator, we landed on the ground floor. And the elevator operator cleared his throat. And I thought, oh, goodness, please don't say anything right now. And, but he cleared his throat and he said, excuse me, uh, Senator Obama. And the then senator looked at him. And he said, I'd like to give you something. And he gave uh, President Obama his military patch. And he tried to hand it to him. And so, of course, everybody in the elevator peeks in trying to figure out, well, what is it? And we realize what it is. And everyone kind of gasps. And um, then Senator Obama says, I couldn't possibly accept your military patch. And he says, no, no, I insist. And the president says, no. And they go back and forth. And so finally, the gentleman said, sir, I served in our military. And I was proud of that service. I've carried this patch with me every day for 40 years. It's kept me strong. It's kept me safe. It's given me the strength to perform a very humble job and provide for my family. And you have a very tough road ahead. And I want you to have this patch. So the president took the patch. And of course, I burst into tears. <laughs> burst into tears. And later I asked him, you know, what did you do with that patch? And he said, well, I put it in my pocket. And I said, oh, isn't that a typical male response? I put it in my pocket. I said, I mean, what did you feel? How did you feel when this man gives you, you know, that's what I'm looking for. And um, he looked at me as he is, tends to do sometimes when clearly I don't get it. And he said, no, Valerie, I meant I put it in my pocket. And he reached in his pocket and he pulled out about 10 or 12 trinkets. And he proceeded to put them on the table and he told me the story behind each one of those, who had given it to him, where he was when he received it, why it was so special that he put it in his pocket. And every day when I um, drive through the gates of the White House, we stop at the checkpoint and the Washington Monument is on the right and it has little red lights because I come in in the dark and I can see those red lights blinking at the top. And every single day I pause and I think about that gentleman. And I think about his service to our country and his, his unbelievable generosity and selflessness in, in giving the president such an important token. And so last night, I thought about that gentleman. Thank you. Thank you for that insight. I'm going to shift gears a little. Um, back to women, I think. Good. There seems to be a backlash against the attention given to women and girls in the U.S. with the forgotten boys dialogue, or perhaps the end of men cover story on the Atlantic, turning the focus back onto the problems of masculinity. What do you see as the role of the White House Council on Women and Girls in an era when some view combating discrimination against women as a done deal? What issues for women and girls do you think will be most central in the future? Well, as long as women are only earning 77 cents on the dollar, I don't think our work is done. As long as there are more women in poverty, as long as we have challenges in terms of education and careers, lucrative careers, as long as every woman I know with a family and a career struggles to achieve the balance and looks for support in a society that should support the balance and provide them, whether it's child care or elder care or fulfilling their um, civic commitments outside of work, whatever the challenges are, we need to be more supportive of women and girls and we need to nurture them. But you know what else? We also need to take care of our boys. And we have a fatherhood initiative that the president launched at the White House, in part because he didn't have a father as a role model. And he looked to Michelle's father. But he knows that so many young boys out there don't have the mentorship that they need. And so his fatherhood initiative is designed to mentor young boys, not just in Washington, but all around the country, and provide them with the role models that we need. And I think that the mistake we can't fall into is thinking that it has to be either or. It should be both and. We should support women and girls, and we should certainly support our boys and our men. And we shouldn't allow the politics to divide us, but yet unify us and bring us together. Every day the president is confronted with new and seemingly intractable problems. That is true. Yeah. <laughs> okay, there's the answer. Both domestic and international. How does he cope with such a full plate, and how do you as an advisor help him to sort out what's most critical? 
That's a very good question. I think some of it has to go to uh, temperament and kind of internal fortitude. Uh, the president is just a very grounded and balanced person. And sometimes there are people who want him to, you know, shake his fist and fight. And I think that um, as a result of how he was raised and the values that his mom and his grandparents instilled in him, gave him a sense of empathy and appreciation for the least of these. And so he wakes up, up every morning really singularly focused on two issues, keeping America safe and growing our economy so that we can be strong. And everything that he does evolves from those basic principles. And so his whole effort in terms of winning the future is we want to out-educate and out-innovate and out-build our competitors to keep our country strong. And as we saw last night, keeping America safe is in the forefront each and every day. And he has a wife and two children who keep him really grounded. And uh, don't as underestimate the value of support systems. And I say this to, to every young audience, uh, and young and old that I meet, you can't do any of this by yourself. Uh, the challenges in our civilization are just too daunting. And so make time to develop the relationships that will give you the su sustenance that you need in the course of the day. And, and keep in mind how important that support is to your loved ones as well. So I think he's surrounded by people who love him. He was raised to appreciate the importance of core decency and values and giving back to a country that he deeply loves and is honored to lead. Uh, and he has a really, really good sense of humor. Thanks. The fundamental issue of concern to most people right now is jobs. Yet progress in cutting unemployment and creating new jobs has been slow. How can government balance the need to trim federal deficits with the need to expand employment? This is the $64,000 or $64 billion, depending upon, in Washington, everything's in billions. Um, this is really, in all seriousness, a very tough question, and, it, and it's the exercise we're going through right now. And we have choices, and I think part of what's so terrific about our democracy is, is that we should have choices, and the path that the president is presenting to the American people embodied in his budget is, look, we do have to tighten our belt. We have got to bring down our deficit, and he outlined a plan to bring down our deficit by uh, trillions of dollars over a 12-year period. And it is doable, but what we have to be mindful of is how we do it. And so we have to be strategic, and we have to continue to invest in what's going to keep America strong. And so if you think about it from the perspective of an, of an employer who could locate right now anywhere in the world they want to locate, with technology being what it is, you locate where you want to be. Well, so in order for us to keep those jobs here in America, we have to educate our young people. I was at a business roundtable earlier today with a group of business leaders from the area, and they talked about the fact that at a time of high unemployment, they're still finding it hard to find a workforce with the skills that they need to employ. So we have to correct that mismatch, and we need to make sure that we are educating our young people and our adults going back for continuing education for the jobs of the future and focusing on energy and looking for new sources of renewable energy, to clean energy, to, to reduce our dependence on foreign oil also keeps us safe again. And so we have to really invest where we get the biggest bang, innovation and science and research, basic science, that will invest, as we would call it maybe as the venture capital money in our future, where the private sector won't go in yet. We have to do what we can do to prime that pump, because what it will do is create an incentive for investment. And that's part of what's so terrific about our country, is that we are the innovators of the world. And then we have to build our infrastructure. And again, companies could invest anywhere, so they're going to want to know, is the technology going to be there? Are the roads and the bridges going to be there? Is the basic infrastructure strong enough to support their businesses? And so we have tough choices to make. And the president and his budget had to make some painful cuts, programs that he might care deeply about. But we can't do everything. Just like families across the country are having to make tough decisions sitting around their kitchen tables, the federal government has to do the same thing. And he's looking forward to engaging in this process with the leadership and members of Congress, because this is something we have to do together. And we had a very successful lame duck session. And although there were many people who didn't get everything that they wanted, our democracy is also about being reasonable and doing what we can do and not letting the perfect be the enemy of the good. 
And as a result of that, we're able, we will be able to get a lot done. So I have reason to be optimistic. I know the president is optimistic. I know the senator is optimistic. And you should know that we are just as determined and as stubborn as we were the day he was elected and haven't. I'm not going to give up one little bit of that energy that you depend upon us to have. I think this is... I think this is going to be our last question. Oh. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, but we want to know what's the most important issue right now uh, that no one is talking about? Uh, we heard a little bit from Rachel Maddow was here a couple of weeks ago, and that question was asked of her. So we're asking what that of you. Say? What did she say? I love Rachel. <laughs> no, we're going, to, we're going to compare. And what about that issue would you like people to be saying? What kind of discussion do you, would you like to see? Well, I'll tell you. I'll go back to something I said in my remarks, and I highlighted what the First Lady and the Second Lady are doing for our military families, because I think we often um, focus on the victims, and we have to, of course, focus on them. But we really shouldn't ex exclude the families. And there's so much that we could do. When our veterans come back, they shouldn't have to wonder or not whether there will be a job for them. They shouldn't have to wonder about whether they'll have the skills that they need. They shouldn't have to wonder about the support system that will reward them for the enormous sacrifice that they made on behalf of our country. So I think that um, I'm so delighted that the First Lady and the Second Lady are putting the real spotlight on this issue because it's something that every community has to own. Every person has a responsibility to the people who allow us to grow, to go to these terrific universities, to conduct our day-to-day -day life without worrying whether or not we are going to be okay because there are people out there fighting on our behalf. And so I think uh, we can't talk about that service enough and we can't educate ourselves about what we could do in this area enough. I also let me say one other thing, which is more general. There are many issues, several of which I talked, touched on in my lecture, that we're focusing on each and every day. I think that the media oftentimes focuses on issues that are going to be sensational and exciting, but aren't really going to affect our fabric and our uh, strength as a country. And so I would say that it's also up to all of you to constantly remind your families, your community, and put pressure on the media to focus on what's really important. The stakes are so high right now. And our country is just, we are moving in the right direction. We've created 1.8 million jobs over the last 13 months, but almost everybody knows someone who's unemployed. So there's so much serious work left to do. The decisions we have to make about the budget will affect everyone in this country. And so let's keep the focus where the focus belongs, keeping us safe and making America as strong as it can be. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.